Around four decades ago, Stanford University did an interesting longitudinal study. They took children, and they wanted to see what the effects of temptation and delayed gratification, how those things might play out over the course of the development of a child as they grew older and older and older. And so they did something called the marshmallow test. And, and in the marshmallow test, what they did is they kind of tried to determine, okay, we're going to put these kids in a room and we're going to give them a marshmallow and we're going to just simply tell them, um, you can have this marshmallow, but if you wait five minutes or so, okay, and not eat it, when we come back, you can have two. And then what they did is they watched these kids and they took notes on wh what kids couldn't wait and what kids did. Well, let's just watch it. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. What Stanford found was that the children who were able to wait for the two marshmallows, as they grew older, grew into more and more better adjusted adults. These children grew into adults who were able to wait, practice delayed gratification, who were able to set longer term goals and meet them, who were able to be patient in their relationships were able to exercise things like forgiveness and things like that in their relationships, whereas the kids who were unable to wait, in many cases, grew into adults who were not as well adjusted, who were not as happy with their life, who had much lower satisfaction scores in terms of vocation, in terms of jobs, in terms of relationships, in terms of money, you name it. And so our ability to recognize temptation 
in our lives and to be able to find ways to not give in to it says a lot about where our maturity is as people, but especially as Christians. Now, there's a rub, which is inevitably we all give in to temptation. Give an amen if that's true about you. We are weak. We are very, very weak. So, is there hope? Yes, there is. Let's stand for our reading this morning. It comes from the epistle of James, James' letter in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Whoops, sorry. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we uh, are going to begin this morning by just taking a quick moment of silence to confess that we are weak and that we have often given into temptation and we seek first and foremost this morning your forgiveness hear our prayers so lord we invite your holy spirit to be present here among us to be our teacher but not merely be our teacher but to fill our minds and hearts bring transformation to our minds and strength to our hearts that we might increasingly walk more closely with you, Lord Jesus. Show us the way and give us strength for it. In your name, all God's people said, amen. amen. You could be seated. So when we open the book of Genesis and we read the first couple of chapters, we see that God is at work in creation. And there's this interesting little phrase that he uses. Every time he creates something, Day one, day two, day three, day four, it always ends with God said that it was good. And the, and the Hebrew word is mayod. God said mayod, it is good. Notice that it doesn't say perfect. It isn't perfect. It's good. And we're going to get to why that is. But then he gets to Adam and Eve. And what's so interesting about the creation narrative is that with every other aspect of creation that we see in days one through five, the way God creates those things is he speaks. He speaks them into existence by the power of his word. John would later write in his gospel that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and through him all things were made. And so John is saying, this Jesus Christ, this is God come to us, and this is the same word that was present when God first created all things. So God speaks all these things into existence. But when it comes to Adam and Eve, he does something different. He does not speak them into existence. The Hebrew word is bara, which means to build. And the word Adam means literally, it's adama, it means red dirt. God takes the dirt of the earth and he bara builds shapes. It's a much more intimate thing that God's creation of who we are is a very intimate thing. Because our relationship with God is intended to be the height, the, the epitome of closeness compared to all of creation. And so he creates first Adam, and then from Adam brings Eve. And when that's all said and done, he doesn't just say that it's good. He doesn't just say mayod. He says it's tov mayod. Very good. And in these two human beings, God places the authority to steward all of the rest of creation. They are given authority and invited into the process of God's ruling alongside him. It's an incredible, incredible privilege that Adam and Eve are given. And they walk every day, it says, with God in the garden in intimacy, in closeness, in friendship, in deep love for each other. 
It's tov me'od, but it's not perfect. Why is it not perfect? Because there's one thing missing. God has to give them choice. Because nothing is perfect if love isn't fully present. Would you agree with that? Amen. And so God gives them, though everything is very good, it's incomplete yet. And God gives them the choice. And that choice manifests itself, whereas these two can eat, it says, from every tree in the garden, including the one called the tree of life. But they are not allowed, they must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now they have a very real choice. And in addition, among all the animals that they have steward and authority over and are living in this incredible peace and harmony with, there is one that comes into the garden that mm, is going to shake things up, a serpent. They have the opportunity to take what is very good and if they simply choose the tree of life to make it perfect. But they don't. Now, there's a real deep significance to what happens next. In order to kind of illustrate that a little bit more, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, there's a great uh, trilogy called The Lord of the Rings. It's a, it's a three-part trilogy written by the great um, British writer J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay? Tolkien was a contemporary with C.S. Lewis. In fact, they were good friends, and them along with a couple of their friends, they used to meet every week at this place called the White Horse Pub, and they would sit and read each other's stories to each other and critique each other. Can you imagine being a fly on the wall in that room? Two of the greatest giants Greatest thinkers of the 20th century sitting there talking to each other about their writings, their, their beliefs, all of that over a pint. Tolkien writes The Lord of the Rings. And in The Lord of the Rings, there are these very powerful Christian themes that run throughout, that are woven throughout the stories. But the story is about a ring. And in this ring is the embodiment of evil. This ring is the embodiment of evil. And there is this little hobbit, that's the name of a creature named Frodo. And of all the different creatures, Frodo is entrusted to destroy this evil ring. Kind of an irony in a way. Well, Frodo feels overwhelmed by this. Doesn't think he can do it. It's too big of a burden. He's exhausted. He's terrified. And he turns to his friend Gandalf, who is a wizard, a good wizard, okay, thinking that, well, Gandalf is stronger. And he says, please, take the rim ring from me. You, you take it. You have it. And Gandalf, okay, Gandalf answers Frodo. He says the following. This is taken not from the movie, but directly from the book, okay? No, cried Gandalf, springing to his feet. With that power... I should have power too great and too terrible. So people want this ring greedily because they want the power that this ring will give them. Okay? But Gandalf says, no, it's too great and too terrible. And over me, he says, the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. Do not tempt me, for I do not wish to become like the dark lord himself, he says. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe or unused. Read the red with me. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. And in that line, Tolkien gives us a clue about what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. The story goes as follows. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, this is interesting, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Notice the first thing the serpent does. You could eliminate the second half of that sentence and just take those first four words. Did God really say? 
and you would find the core of sin in our lives. Really. Think about it. When we do something that we know is sin, it isn't just a mistake, is it? We all make mistakes. But there's a huge difference between a mistake and sin and rebellion. I remember the first time that I cognitively sinned. I still remember that day. So when we do that, what's at the heart of that? We know God says, do this or don't do this. But what do we do? We say, ah, really? We echo the serpent. He's there whispering, did he really say this? Do you think that's what he really meant? I don't know. Do you think you can trust him? What is the serpent doing? He's sowing mistrust. Did God really say that? And notice what he says, that you must not eat from any tree in the garden. He wildly overstates God's command, right? Makes him look like a tyrant. That's certainly not what God said. God said there's just one you can't eat from. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And look at what Satan and the serpent answers. You will certainly not die. Hmm? No, you won't. So not only does he introduce mistrust of God to Eve, but now he just says, God's lying to you. God's holding out on you. Hmm? And just ask yourself, think about this for a sec. Haven't there been times in all of our lives where we've kind of thought that? I really want to do this, God, but you, your, your word says not to do it. I don't know. You're... You're like ruining my fun. Hmm? For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. Read the next line with me. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And boy, isn't that the core of our sin. God says, do this, don't do that. And we're like, ah, I don't know about that. I think maybe I know better. Right? It's kind of that simple. Now, sometimes, yes, we are deceived. But that deception still preys on something in us, huh, that wants to be God. He says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then here's the, the deeper part of the lie. Let's go back. What does Gandalf say to Frodo? Hmm? I would not have the strength to wield that ring. Hmm? You see, Gandalf understood the eternal price demanded when one presumes to play God. He says, yes, I know the ring is, I could have immense power if I had it, but I would not have the strength to wield it. It would control me, not me control it. And this is what Adam and Eve did not grasp. You can be like God, knowing good and evil. But what the devil didn't tell him is, oh, by the way, you won't be able to control it. Now there's there's a, there's a depth to that little thing that the devil says. He says, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. In the Old Testament, whenever we see that word, it doesn't just mean to intellectually know something. Oh, that's good and that's evil. Knowing is, is, a, is a word that's often used to have intimacy with something um, and to have control over it in many cases. So, for example, a lot of times the word knowing in the Old Testament is used um, when two people are in sexual relationships with each other. So-and-so knew some, somebody, okay? But the point is, is it's, it's, a, it's a much deeper, intimate word. And so what Satan is saying to them is, oh, you'll, you'll, be able, you'll know good and evil. You'll have control over it. You know that authority that you already exercise over everything? Now you're going to have authority over this too, and that's going to make you more like God. And it's a lie, because they find out very quickly that, yes, 
they know good and evil now, but we do not have the ability to control it. And that knowledge controls us, not the other way around. And man, let me ask this question. Does not our history as human beings, is that not evidence of that truth or what? Huh? Turn on the news today and all you're going to see is example after example of example of humanity knowing good and evil but yet never really being able to control that power. It's true in the big picture, but it's true right here in every one of us too, isn't it? Amen? Amen. It is. It is. And so they take it, they eat, and all of a sudden, not only does sin affect them, and I shouldn't say affect, I would also go so far as to say infects them. They are now infected with this disease. I, I almost think of it like a genetic something happens in them. And they all of a sudden are bent towards evil. They, they know good and evil, but, but they find themselves now unable to wield that power, unable to control that. Okay? And they are infected, but not only them, but because they're the stewards of all of the creation that God made. That peace and that harmony that exists, right? It ripples through them into all of the creation. All of it, all of a sudden, becomes distorted. And this ripple effect is wicked. Okay, we see, for example, the first thing that happens is shame. They hear God and they hide. And, and God says, what, why are you hiding? Well, we're naked. Who told you you were naked? They realize they're naked and they're shameful. And what's the first relationship that's broken as a result of that? Their relationship with God. And once that's broken, it just filters all the way down, doesn't it? So shame is the first thing. And then blame. And boy, is blame on display all of a sudden. Adam especially. Adam, <laughs> he, you talk about grammar. Adam is able to blame two people simultaneously in one sentence. God says, what is going on here? Why did you do this? Why did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat? And Adam's response is he looks at God and he says, the woman you gave me. <laughs> wow. I don't think the male species has ever been more articulate in all the wrong ways. <laughs> right? He blames two people, two in one. And he's wrong on both accounts, really, at the heart of it. God, the woman you gave me made me do this. And then what does the woman do? Well, it's the serpent. She blames the serpent. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. Right? Young people. Young people. There used to be, many years ago, this comedian named Flip Wilson. Did you hear that, young people? Because the old people know exactly where I'm about to go. And Flip Wilson, right, this is comedian, he had this line that he always used in his comedy, and it was what? Everybody, old people tell him. The devil made me do it. That's right. And it really is a comedic line because it's so untrue. Yes, we could be deceived by the devil. Yes, he will seek to push your individual buttons, your sin buttons, whether it's greed or pride or whatever it is. But we always have the choice. We always have the choice. All right. So shame, blame, pain. All of a sudden now, the wonder of childbirth that should have been a joy becomes painful for Eve. That's a bad deal. Hmm? And even for Adam, what used to be wonderful peace and harmony and just gathering food for them in the garden, all of a sudden now he's going to have to produce the food from the ground and it's going to resist him and it's going to be hard and dry and it's going to produce thorns and thistles 
and it's going to be a painful process. And the very animals that they used to have wonderful peace and harmony in their authority over, now there is, there is a broken relationship even between them. The very animals that they used to walk among now are a danger to them. In many ways, with that first sin, as the infection spread through Adam and Eve and into all of creation, the creation all of a, all of a sudden shifted and became very Darwinian. That's why when people say, do you believe in evolution and Darwin, my answer is, well, partially. Partially. Because what we see here is what used to be peaceful and love and harmony is broken. What does Darwin say hmm? in his evolution? It's all about the survival of the, right? And so survival is red in tooth and claw. It's violent. And that's exactly what happened. Violence becomes part of the everyday experience for Adam and Eve. And boy, it's going to go south in a hurry. We'll see that next week. Relational dysfunction comes in. God says to Eve, now your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. What was probably a much more harmonious, equal, partner-like relationship. It's a, it, the Hebrew literally means in creation, helpmate, now is askew. Toil, we talked about. And then finally, death. Death. You surely won't die. Only a partial truth. You won't die now. But not only will you eventually die physically, you're dying spiritually. You're no longer connected to the one who created you. You're no longer connected to the very source of life that you have been living upon. Very significant stuff. And we look at this moment in the story and we think, good Lord, we're only three chapters into the whole story and the whole thing has gone pear-shaped. It looks like the end. It's the end of innocence, but it's more than just the end of innocence. It looks like it's the end of everything. This disease is going to take over and win. It looks like an inoperable, unstoppable cancer of sin. But we have to remember that the end of innocence with God is actually the beginning of redemption. Now let me ask this question. Do you think that God was surprised by any of this? No. And that's the good news. God knew this was going to happen. This was part of his plan from the moment they conceived of creation within the Trinity. Okay? He knew that this was going to be necessary because the highest goal, right? What does Paul write? These three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The highest goal is love. And free will and choice needed to be there. And it eventually needed to be done freely. And so he knew that this was going to be the path. This was going to be the path. And it was going to cost. But it was going to be worth everything about it. And so immediately in this story, instead of saying, oh, that looked bad, the end. Don't you, have you ever read a book or watched a movie where it had a really bad, sad ending? Have you? How'd you like that? You hate it, don't you? You just instinctively hate that, don't you? It's as if we're made to want that happy ending. Isn't that interesting? And there is one. But it's going to take a long process because God is not interested in doing the short, easy thing. He's only interested in doing the long-term, perfect thing. Okay? And so in the story now, God inserts himself. He responds. He doesn't react. He knows what's going on. He responds with provision, prevention, and promise. So let's go through that quick. Okay? So God starts with provision. He responds and he says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now we read that and we think, okay, obviously, 
right? The creation's gone, and it's probably not nice and sunny and warm anymore. It might be cold and windy and everything, and he needs protection. So God gives him garments of skin. But what we're, what we're tempted to do is, is to not think a little bit more deeply about that simple sentence, which is this. In order for God to provide those garments of skin, what had to happen? It would be God himself that would shed the first blood out of necessity to protect Adam and Eve. An animal would have to die, maybe more than one. And there we see the first example of a theme that will run all throughout Scripture and culminate in its ultimate example, and that is that redemption costs. Redemption costs always costs something. How many of you have ever been to a restaurant and somebody anonymously bought you a meal? You're like, oh, the bill, oh, it's been paid for. Has that ever happened to any of you? Yeah? RJ? So the meal was free for you. But was it free? It's never actually free, is it? It just was free for you. It was by their grace that you had that, isn't it? Ah, remember that. Redemption costs. And God begins the process of paying the price on our behalf to restore that which has fallen. Then we go to prevention. This one is a little paradoxical. Then the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Who is us? I think the Trinity. Okay? One of us, knowing good and evil. He he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Think about that. Was at, were Adam and Eve allowed to eat from the tree of life before the sin? Yes. In fact, that's what would have been the preferable thing, right? But now they're not allowed to. Why? Because the infection of evil is within them. And God allows death now to happen and it's temporary, and we're still in that place, okay? But he allows death in order to curb evil. This is why when we read the Bible, you see in the first few books of the Bible how the lifespan of humans with every generation goes down. Okay? Now you're thinking, how could that be a blessing from God? Let me ask you this question. Okay, um, how many of you would feel good about Adolf Hitler living forever? Not so good, right? Not so good. God does temporary curbing of evil in order for his plan to work out. Historically, man has sought immortality without regard to moral perfection. Ponce de Leon and the there. See, you, even now you remember the myth, right? Man has always looked for ways to extend their life, to, to live forever, but ignore the fallen evil state of their heart. And so we want to just extend our lives and leave our evil, rotten hearts alone. Whoops. <laughs> wow. I need a bigger platform, obviously. But God does the opposite. He moves in the opposite direction. He says, no, no, no. We need to heal your heart first. We need to make you good again. And once that happens, once that happens, then the reverse will happen. The great reversal of the fall will happen. And everything will also be made good and healed again. Jesus said as much in Revelation when he said, Behold, I make all things new. Heaven, ladies and gentlemen, always begins with transformation of our minds and our hearts. Doesn't Paul write, right? Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and heart, right? Heaven is about transformation first, here and here long before it's about destination. It starts in our hearts and works. It's a reverse ripple effect. 
I love scripture. It's so incredibly amazing. And then finally, God makes a promise. And it's the first prophecy of a coming Savior. He says to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. She's going to have her and her line. One day will give birth to one, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. You will strike him, devil, but he will crush you. And the devil thought he won on Good Friday. But on Easter morning, he realized he'd been crushed. The first prophecy and promise. This is true for all of us in the sense of we have hope. We are not able to wield this knowledge of good and evil. None of us can, amen? We sin every day, don't we? And we'd be tempted to think that there's no hope, but there is hope because somebody is redeeming us and paying the cost. There was a man named John many years ago, and he he grew into an adult that was fairly, I would say, quite evil. But he had a change of heart. He was a slave trader, and he took part in the horrific slave trade practice, bringing slaves to Great Britain. But then one night, after reading a book called The Imitation of Christ, during a storm, he turned to Jesus and repented. One day, a friend of his would come to visit him. His, this friend would be named William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce would lead the abolition of slavery in Great Britain decades before it happened in the United States. Why would William do that? Because William himself came to know the same Jesus Christ and Savior. In the great movie Amazing Grace, I highly recommend it, Wilberforce comes to visit John, and they have a discussion about how William is going to do this. And John wants to give him his written testimony well, let's just watch. Leave it. They only told me your sight was fading. Well, now it's faded altogether. I never did things by half. Scott decided I'd seen enough. So it's true. What's true? Writing your account. I wish I could see your face. How are you looking? Same. Still too thin. A little fatter lately. Oh, she feeds you well then, this wife of yours? She's given me an appetite. Uh, an appetite to change things? This is my confession. You must use it. Names, ship's records, ports, people, everything I remember is in here. Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. You must publish it. Blow a hole in their boat with it. Damn them with it. I wish I could remember all their names. My 20,000 ghosts. They all have names. Beautiful African names. We call them with just grunts. Noises. We were apes. They were human. <laughs> I'm weeping. 
I couldn't weep till I wrote this. <laughs> I once was blind, but now I see. Didn't I write that too? Yes, you did. Well, now at last it's true. Now go, we'll go. We've lots of work to do, you and I. His name was John Newton. And he wrote it. Sing it with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind. But now I see. The end of his innocence was just the beginning of his redemption. And due to him and the work of his friend William, it would be the redemption of many. That would simply be one chapter in the great story of reversal. The end of innocence only opens the door to God himself. Amen? Father, may it be true in our hearts and minds and our lives. We give our sin to you. We acknowledge our inability to wield the knowledge of good and evil. But we invite your spirit, the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, to come into our hearts and transform our hearts and minds until that great day when that transformation will work itself out in the great reversal.